Chronicles in the east of England, and it's my absolute pleasure to be invited um, to the meeting of this prestigious um, and historic university. Um, I'm well aware of the, the, the history of um, Al-Azhar University, um, and uh, it's only my regret that uh, this has to be done virtually and, and for reasons entirely relevant to the title of this talk, I'm unable to be with you in person. Um, of course, I've been invited to talk about vaccinations uh, for COVID-19 in our patient population with IBD, but it's fitting that we start maybe by considering what the risk of infection is for patients with IBD. And it's been well established long before COVID was on the scene that patients with IBD do appear to carry an increased risk of infection. And this has been shown in um, some very large cohort studies from uh, uh, multiple healthcare settings. And at least some of this risk probably relates to the medications that the patients are on, but there's always been this sense that maybe there is a background risk, a, a state of um, almost immunodeficiency, if you like, associated with the inflammation that's seen in patients with IBD that makes these patients inherently more vulnerable to developing um, adverse uh, outcomes and, and to, to catching infections in the first place. But of course, medications are probably responsible for much of this risk. And we've seen studies such as the TREAT registry that you see here, um, showing that, for example, the use of anti-TNF therapy uh, confers some increase in risk of serious infection. Steroids probably are the single worst uh, medication that we use in that regard. And of course, combination therapy of anti-TNF and thiopurines also appears to carry increased risk. That's been shown in uh, certainly some quite old registries now, but more recently we've seen some massive registry data coming out of France um, with uh, almost complete capture of the entire French population, demonstrating that there is uh, apparently um, a slight increase in risk of um, uh, infections, serious infections in patients with ulcerative colitis when treated with anti-TNF therapy compared to vedolizumab if we use vedolizumab as our, as our benchmark. Um, but interestingly, this difference between vedo and anti-TNF therapy doesn't appear to carry across to risk of serious infection in patients with Crohn's disease. So maybe the distinction between anti-TNF and vedolizumab is uh, perhaps less relevant than we'd previously thought. So with that preamble, let's come straight away to COVID-19 and ask, uh, or start by asking what we know of IBD and COVID-19. And of course, we come immediately to this massive international effort of the IBD community to understand the impact of this novel virus on our patients. And the Secure IBD Registry that I'm sure uh, many of you will be aware of, if, if indeed not having contributed data to, um, is effectively a um, physician reported registry of patients with inflammatory bowel disease monitoring their outcomes. And um, we know this is dominated for the most part by patients from the USA, but by no means are these exclusively US patients. This is a truly global registry. There is inherent in any registry a reporting bias. So it may well be that only the more severe cases get reported or the more interesting cases. Um, and so we have to bear that in mind, no matter how big the sample size. But it's certainly true that within secure IBD, we see some perhaps unsurprising observations such as that older patients are more at risk of adverse outcomes indeed. So are patients with comorbidities or patients with severe underlying IBD activity. But what of drugs? And again here, bear in mind the risk of reporting bias, but it certainly seems that adverse outcomes are more common in patients treated with steroids. There was this initial observation around mesalazine that was a bit surprising. I don't think any of us really see mesalazine as a particularly dangerous drug, but it did appear that patients treated with mesalazine were having worse outcomes. And then a bunch of other outcomes that didn't appear to really differ from the background population associated with the other drugs that, 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 that we use. And this mesalazine signal, I think, was a, a bit of a confusing one. And then very recently um, at ECHO just a few weeks ago, we saw further um, uh, multivariable analysis of the data on mesalazine use, effectively showing that if you correct uh, for underlying disease activity and comorbidities, then the signal goes away. And so there doesn't appear to be any risk associated with, uh, with, with the drug uh, alone. And that's seen um, both in terms of correction for underlying activity and also when we do this stratified by uh, the other medications that the patient is in receipt of.
So with that said, what happens when we vaccinate patients uh, with COVID-19 uh, vaccines? Well, first of all, we should remind ourselves that vaccines for the most part have been a massive success story of 20th and now hopefully 21st century medicine with uh, a wide variety of um, uh, viral and bacterial infections uh, seriously combated, if not almost completely eradicated by the introduction of global vaccination programs. At the same time, we know that not everyone responds uniformly to vaccination, and certainly there have been multiple cohort studies showing that in patients with IBD, particularly in receipt of anti-TNF therapy or immunomodulators, we appear to see impaired responses to pneumococcal uh, vaccination. And likewise, the same story is probably true of uh, antiviral immunity in patients treated with uh, influenza vaccines. And we've seen that not just uh, now with multiple different strains of influenza vaccine, but also with hepatitis vaccination uh, and other uh, available vaccines, suggesting overall some impairment of seroprotection or seroconversion in these patients. Of course, the laboratory record of a failure or a lower level of seroconversion doesn't necessarily translates through into what matters in the real world, which is clinical susceptibility to infection or e indeed adverse outcomes if a patient does get infection, infected, because with seroconversion, we're just capturing one component of the immune response, the B cell response. And we should remind ourselves that vaccination does induce other uh, immune responses, including, for example, T cell responses. Nevertheless, we know that uh, TNF is particularly important for the development of antibodies. And so in mice, for example, that lack uh, TNF, uh, they don't adequately form germinal centers when immunized with an imogen, in this case, sheep red blood cells, and therefore they fail to seroconvert um, uh, in some quite old laboratory studies now. It's not just about uh, TNF, there's a whole host of other components, of course, involved in the immune response, and many of our medications target many of these different components of the immune response. Nevertheless, some of the medications we use have not been previously associated with impaired systemic immune responses. And I come back to vedolizumab here. Again, this uh, experiment showing that if you immunize patients systemically with hepatitis B vaccination, whilst on uh, vedolizumab, they show appropriate seroconversion. Uh, the same is not true if you orally immunize them with, a, with, a, with an oral vaccine. And so uh, in the UK, we set out to perform a study looking at the impact of biologic therapies we were using on, uh, first of all, to infection and, and immunity to uh, SARS-CoV-2, and then also to look, extend this to look at response in the vaccination program. So this was a massive UK-wide effort involving 92 different sites across the UK. And in a very short space of time, we rapidly recruited almost 7,000 patients just prior to, uh, to Christmas or just prior to December uh, 2020 uh, in the three months leading up to that. And uh, we were able to link uh, data from those patients with uh, nationally available data on their uh, PCR testing for uh, presence of the virus. So what did that mean? Well, uh, to start with, we had a population which already had some background immunity to uh, SARS-CoV-2 because by the time we started this study, about four or five percent of the UK population had uh, antibodies against uh, the virus. And it was clear already that there were some disparities here. So people with uh, lower or scoring higher on in income deprivation scores. So people from lower socioeconomic groups were more likely to have been exposed to the um, to the virus. Uh, patients of, uh, of non-white ethnicity ethnicity were more likely to have been exposed to the virus and of course there was regional variation. But already it was clear that there were distinctions in rates of background seroprevalence and vedolizumab. So the suggestion was that patients on infliximab might be failing to seroconvert and that was particularly true of patients uh, on infliximab in the presence of an immunomodulator. Um, of course, that was a theory. We could test that by taking the population who was seronegative at the start of the study, following them prospectively, and then seeing the rate at which they seroconverted following documented PCR positivity for SARS-CoV-2. So patients who we knew for a fact had been exposed to the virus, we could then track and see whether they seroconverted. And it's quite clear that infliximab leads to an impairment of the immune response uh, for these patients upon natural exposure 
uh, to the virus. And this can be seen in the time between PCR positivity and the development of anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. And uh, if you look at the dark blue bars here, this is the vedolizumab response, so exposure leading to, uh, on a logarithmic scale, generation of antibodies against SARS-CoV-2, whereas on the same scale, patients on infliximab uh, showing little, if any, evidence of seroconversion. Now, what's the implication of all of this for when we vaccinate patients? Well, again, we could look at these same cohorts of patients who had started out uh, in our study and look at their rates of seroconversion after their first dose of uh, two vaccines, both double, uh, double dose vaccine strategies, the Pfizer vaccine on the left and the so-called Oxford or AstraZeneca vaccine on the right here. And what we can see is that patients given a single dose of these vaccines, generally speaking, showed low rates of seroconversion if they're on infliximab, much better rates of seroconversion if they're on vedolizumab. Um, and uh, the arbitrary uh, background line here, the green line here, uh, 15 international units per mil is thought to roughly correlate with the, uh, the level of antibody that you need for, uh, for, for good uh, protection. And we could perform a, a, a multivariable analysis and identify that again, obviously the choice of biologic, but also the presence of immunomodulator, particularly for patients on infliximab, appeared to be associated with impaired rates of seroconversion. Uh, this is a relatively busy slide, but I'll just draw your attention to the bottom here and say, it's not just about drugs. So patients with Crohn's disease were less likely to seroconvert, older patients were less likely to seroconvert and smokers were less likely to seroconvert. Interestingly, in contrast to the earlier findings, non-white ethnicity individuals were more likely to mount a good immune response against the vaccine. Now that's all well and good, but I mentioned already these are double dose uh, vaccines. So what happens when you give patients either two doses or they get a single dose having already had natural infection with the virus. And here the story is a much more reassuring one. So uh, first of all, on the far left-hand side here of each of these uh, plots, you're seeing the single uh, exposure group. And of course, in green here, single exposure on infliximab, low rates of seroconversion. In orange, single exposure uh, on vedolizumab, slightly better, but still somewhat low rates of seroconversion. The really important thing to note is in individuals who have had either um, a single dose and prior infection, which is these middle columns here, or uh, a single dose, uh, or, or sorry, and two doses uh, of uh, a, a vaccine, we see very good rates of seroconversion, and that's perhaps better understood on this slide. So here you see the two different vaccines, Pfizer and the Oxford vaccine, uh, with single dose um, uh, of vaccine, and we see relatively low rates of seroconversion with infliximab, with or without immunomodulator in green. But the really important and encouraging uh, section is the section on the right here. After two vaccines, uh, both the uh, in infliximab and the vedolizumab group show good rates of seroconversion to both vaccines. So what can we conclude? Well, it's certainly true that the uh, seroconversion rates are lower in patients on infliximab, either after natural infection or after a single dose of uh, vaccine. And this isn't just about drugs, it's also about older age, Crohn's disease, immunomodulator use or current smoking. Um, uh, and as I've said already, non-white ethnicity appeared to be interestingly associated with better responses against uh, the, uh, the vaccine or the virus. Nonetheless, um, what's important is that after two doses, we see protection for the majority, but not all patients. So turning that round, about 18% of patients on infliximab failed to seroconvert even after two exposures, or 5% of the vedolizumab treated cohort failed to seroconvert. So, of course, there are still some unknowns and we're working on these at the moment. One of the questions is what all of this means uh, for natural immunity or, or for, for protective immunity. I mentioned already this isn't just about B cells. There may well be a T cell component and we're, we're looking at T cell responses in a subset of these individuals. But of course, the really important question now is how long any protection that's conferred lasts for and whether there is a rapid decay. We've already got some signals suggesting that patients on anti-TNF therapy show an increased rate of decay. So even though they may seroconvert, their antibody teeters drop off. And this will, of course, have immediate implications when we get beyond the present 
crisis uh, and start moving into an era where we're realistically going to be thinking about not just uh, the double dose of vaccine, but potentially further booster doses of vaccines. And it may well be that we have a population of patients with inflammatory bowel disease who will require uh, ongoing vaccination, much as we currently do for influenza um, in the future to provide them and, and keep their, their immunity topped up. So with that, I'll conclude and thank you once again uh, for your kind invitation, your kind attention, and I hope um, that you found this talk helpful and I wish you all the very best. Thank you.